science connects the complexity of life. It guides public policy. It uncovers new opportunities. Science connects researchers on Virginia Tech's campus, builds powerful industry partnerships, and helps solve the challenges that face our lives today. Hello everyone, this is Becky Freemall with Science Connects here on Virginia Tech's campus. And with me is Shahoko Kojima. She's a researcher here on Virginia Tech's campus who deals with circadian rhythms. I'll kind of give a, a general segue, if you will. Uh, but Shahoko, you're here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about the research you do. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Shihoko and I am an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. And my group studies circadian rhythms uh, using a mouse as an animal model. Okay. You know, in the past, uh, there's been some conversation. We've spoken about applied versus basic research. You have said your research falls in that column of basic research. What exactly do you mean by that? So basic research is to understand how things work in nature. For example, how do birds fly? Why does water get frozen when it's cold? Why is the sky blue? So things like that. Okay. So my um um my interest is towards the basic science, uh, and that is based on my experiences as an graduate student back in Japan. Um. So uh, as an undergraduate, I was working in a lab who studies microbiology and immunology. And then I was specifically studying uh, this pathogenic bacteria that's called enterohemorrhagic uh, E. coli. That is a type of bacteria that can potentially kill people. And then, then my specific study was to understand why the bacteri bacteria can kill people. And uh, there, well, luckily or unluckily, there was an outbreak in the area of this pathogenic E. coli when I was an undergraduate student, and uh, all the lab was working on understanding what's the level of you know um, contamination, what's the source of the contamination, why some people are getting sick or you know dead while others are resistant to the bacteria, and the lab was a mixture of a lot of medical doctors and the researchers or PhD people. Um, and then uh, my naive sense from that experience was that all the medical doctors or medically associated people would go out and talk with the people, trying to directly help people versus the people in science or research, heavy people, PhD people, or stay in the lab, analyzing the data. And then uh, in my naive thought that that was... Not fair. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> uh, so that got me to think about what's the difference between MD researcher versus PhD researcher. And I just thought the PhD type of work is what I wanted to do. Okay. So I started to look into like what I can do in terms of basic research, which is to just understand the nature of the things. Mm -hmm. So in my field, the bi biological, life science, health-related field, that is to understand the normal function of the body. And then the diseases are caused when those normal functions are compromised. And uh, to understand how to treat those people, you need to understand how the body is normally supposed to work. And then that's how I started to focus on the basic research. And then um, I wanted to really understand how body actually works. Okay. So when you talk about like E. coli and the basic research, where does circadian rhythm fit into all of this? What does your research entail when it comes to circadian rhythm and, and, and what exactly is circadian rhythm? Right. So at the time, I was looking for my PhD research theme and as I said, I wanted to do the basic research that's not associated with diseases at all. So I was looking through some um, conferences where the people gather and then you know present their research findings, and that's when I first found out what the circadian rhythms are. 
And later I learned that circadian rhythms are the cycles in your body that runs every day and that regulates a lot of your, for example, sleep-wake cycles, uh, body temperature, uh, hormone secretion, um, other cognitive functions, how brain works. So, and then I thought that was a perfect research that I wanted to pursue in my future career. And then that's how I got involved in the research of circadian, circadian rhythms. And do all organisms, organisms have circadian rhythm or just humans? Theoretically speaking, yes, all the organisms ha- will have to have. And that is because the circadian rhythms are the mechanisms to adapt to the Earth's rotation, which is roughly speaking, 24 hours every day. So if you know when the sun is going to come out and when the, when the sun is going to set, you kind of know when to look for your food as an organism and then when to do, you know, when to do defense against your competitors in the wild. So, well, because that's the origin of the circadian rhythms, all the organisms, not just animals, not just humans, but plants have it, we know that. Uh, microorganisms such as bacteria also have the mechanisms, um, and that's, yeah. It sounds like when you're doing basic research, you almost cannot ignore circadian rhythm. Like, I feel like hearing you say that everyone should be doing circadian rhythm as a part <laughs> of, of the bigger picture. I'm buying you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, how does it fit into your research? Like, are, are there any big pressing questions you're trying to answer with your circadian rhythm um, S- yes. so, research? Yes. Um, so we, we currently are focusing on this new genetic factor that we found a few years ago, and that's the focus of our research group at the moment. Um, So we knew before that in human that there's approximately a dozen of genes, so 12 genes that are important to um, generate those circuited rhythms in your body. And I think, or we think, we found another one that's a new one that is also involved in this generation of circadian rhythms in your cell. We don't know what this genetic factor is, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Interesting. What, the, this, what this genetic factor does and whether that's important really for our circadian rhythms. And what creates circadian rhythm? I think people, the, the lay person, so to speak, maybe thinks, oh, well, you know, when you talk about circadian rhythm, it's when the sun is up or when the sun is down. And, and maybe I'm wrong, but if I recall, last time I spoke to a researcher on this, it, even cells in the deepest part of your body that don't see sunlight still know what time of day, where you are in this process. Right. Um, so we used to think the brain is the part of your body that generates the circadian rhythms. And then we start to understand that that's not true anymore. We start to understand that not only the cells in the brain, neurons, the cells in liver, kidney, lung, even your skin cells have those machineries uh, in each cell um, that can uh, generate the circadian rhythms. So we don't exactly know how brain does control other tissues at the moment. But we know that all the parts of your body have machinery inside, and then they all tick, tock, tick, tock. Interesting. So when you talk about this genetic factor that you found, the, the it, since you're not exactly sure what <laughs> it is, it's like Oz behind the curtain, um, it's hard to ask this, but do you think there'll be more genetic factors like this one, even though you don't know what it is? Right, Ho- hopefully <laughs> so. So we so we call this as a genetic factor and not a gene because we don't know if this is a gene. Gotcha. So we used to think that those are the characteristics of a gene. So if you have found a gene, you need to have you know X, Y, and Z to say that this is a gene. So this new genetic factor that we found 
doesn't fully have those criteria all checked. So we don't know if we can call this as a gene at this moment, and that's why we're saying this as a genetic factor at the moment. I think, personally, that this genetic factor acts like a gene, mm -hmm. but it's probably not the typical gene that we knew of. So that's, the, that's why we're trying to figure if this is really a gene, or if this is a genetic factor, or can, if this is not a gene, why is there? Right. And what then what it? does that do? So someday you're, you're going to pull back that curtain and tell us all the answers. Oh, hopefully so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be waiting. Um, and how important is it to conduct research like this in an institute setting where you have that kind of multidiscipline, transdisciplinary approach? So it's not just all researchers that work on one thing, but you have this plethora of disciplines before you to kind of interact with everyone. Right. So um, because this genetic factor is not does not look like a gene, we just didn't know how to tackle this problem, right? So if that was a gene, we knew how to understand the function of the gene. So what you do is to break the gene, see what happens, and that's a traditional way to understand what a gene does. But because this is not a gene in a typical traditional sense, we didn't know, we didn't have um, idea, the clear idea how we can break the gene because it doesn't look like a gene. So that's why I started to work with some folks who are specialized in math, in equations. So not me. No. <laughs> I don't know. You may be the one. I don't no. know. No. <laughs> you, you went far from my personality trait to find those people. <laughs> yeah, so I sought a help to those people who have like a math or equation expertise to see if, if they can help me design the experiment or come up with some prediction what this genetic factor may be doing. And that led to this transdisciplinary approach in understanding this genetic factor, not just a biologist like myself, but involving other people who have different expertise. And then how, that's how we started to work together. So I feel like I'm about to ask you an interview question on, um, tell me about your five-year plan. However, <laughs> I am not going to be kind. I'm going to bust it out on you, which is looking ahead. You're talking about this genetic factor. You're not really sure what it is. Circadian rhythm, I feel like we know what it is. You know, it rotates, like you said, 24 hours and, and sun and light. But I would gather it is also evolving. And where do you see all of this? Tell me about your 10-year plan, Shihoko. But where do you see all this in 10 years? <laughs> so that is very difficult to predict because we know that we need, what we knew 10 years ago was unimaginable these days. You know, so what we knew 10 years ago and then their prediction 10 years after that was not what, where we are at the moment. So... My guess would be the time will tell. Yeah. Don't, don't you hate that interview question? Have you ever had that? Every time I ask interview? the question to, to people, <laughs> but I've never got myself. See, so. that those people all came back to me and said, hey, ask her about her tender <laughs> plan. Get her back. Get her back. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Your research is absolutely amazing. Thank it, you for it, having me. Here. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. And, you know, I just wanted to let our listeners know, too, um, that we have more research dealing with circadian rhythm. One of our researchers, Carla Finkelstein, actually, a researcher here on Virginia Tech's campus, also spoke to us about cancer's connection to circadian rhythm. And you can listen to her podcast as well on Science Connect. So for Science Connects, I am Becky Freemall here with Shihoko Kojima. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Sharing knowledge accelerates discovery. To learn about other transdisciplinary collaborations, go to research.vt.edu.